Previously, host Hal Holbrook and guest experts revealed the story of the biblical Sabbath from the beginning of human time. Originally established as the pivot point of the weekly cycle, the seventh day stood for thousands of years as the seal of the Creator's power and authority. The Ten Commandments, bedrock principles for human life, elevated the seventh-day Sabbath to the level of divine decree. During the lifetime of Jesus Christ, contention and debate raged over the issue of proper Sabbath-keeping. The Jewish way of Sabbath-keeping was very legalistic. You couldn't move, you couldn't do anything. By healing the man with the withered hand, Jesus showed the true spirit of the Sabbath. He rejected the rabbi's rules. He kept the Sabbath as taught in the ancient Hebrew scriptures. Jesus did not break the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments. What he did was to defy human laws and traditions. So where and when did Christians first begin to observe an alternate day of worship? The first law requiring people to celebrate on Sunday and rest on Sunday was uh, a law promulgated by the Emperor Constantine in the year 321. In spite of the popularity of sun worship and the Sunday laws of emperors, many Christians continued to worship on the seventh day Sabbath. In fact, Christian churches that abandoned the Sabbath were in the minority. And now we continue the story of the Sabbath controversy in part three of the seventh day. Revelations from the Lost Pages of History. I am Patrick, a sinner most unlearned, the least of all the faithful, and utterly despised by many. My father was Calponius, a deacon, son of Petitius, a priest of the village of Banavum Tabernia. He had a country seat nearby, and there I was taken captive. I was then about 16 years of age. I did not know the true God. I was taken into captivity to Ireland with many thousands of people, and deservedly so, because we turned away from God and did not keep his commandments. This is a copy of St. Patrick's Confession, the testimony of a man who is often considered the most famous Irishman of all time. But myths and legends often obscure his true identity. Was he a great miracle-working missionary to Ireland? Was he the one who chased the snakes off the Emerald Isle? Who was he, really? Welcome to part three of the seventh day, Revelations from the Lost Pages of History. I'm Hal Holbrook. We're about to see the St. Patrick of history, quite a different man from the Patrick of legend and tradition and we'll soon go on to uncover more about the long drawn out effort to replace the biblical Sabbath with Sunday as a universal Christian day of worship. Patrick was born in late fourth century Scotland into a Celtic Christian culture. His religion was quite different from the Latin or Roman Christianity that was taking over in other parts of Western Europe. We don't really know who the first Celtic Christians were. We don't seem to know who brought Christianity to them. We're not even certain when all of that began. But what we do know is what they believed, based on the writings of Patrick and the others. And we know that what they believed was based on their understanding of Scripture. Unlike the theologians of Roman Christianity, who appealed more and more to the teachings of church and councils, Celtic teachers stressed the Bible. This loyalty to the Bible is what separated the Celtic Christians from the much larger Roman Christian community. Because the Bible was the foundation of their faith, 
it was difficult for them to accept the authority of the Roman church. You see, the Celtic church grew up beyond the reach of Roman influence. It was rooted in the Sabbath-keeping church that began with Jesus and his apostles back in the first century. The background from which the Celtic Christians received their Christianity indicates to us that they were strong believers in what the scriptures said. They wanted to do what the Bible told them to do. That same background indicates for us that they got their Christianity before Sunday keeping uh, came into vogue. There is nothing in Patrick's works which indicates his acceptance of the teachings of church fathers. He appealed solely to the scriptures in support of what he believed, practiced, and propagated. So this was Patrick's religion, based on the Bible, faithful to its teachings, and obedient to its commandments. This was the religion he was destined to carry to the Irish. Kidnapped by raiders, Patrick and thousands of others found themselves carried off to Ireland to be sold like so much livestock. There he spent six long years working for a farmer as a slave. Every day I had to tend sheep, and many times a day I prayed. The love of God and his fear came to me more and more, and my faith was strengthened. And this even when I was staying in the woods and on the mountains. And I used to get up for prayer before daylight, through snow, through frost, through rain. And there one night I heard in my sleep a voice saying to me, Soon you will go to your own country. And again after a short while I heard a voice saying to me, See, your ship is ready. And it was not near, but at a distance of perhaps 200 miles, and I had never been there, nor did I know a living soul there. And then I took to flight, and I left the man with whom I had stayed for six years. And I went in the strength of God, who directed my way to my good, and I feared nothing until I came to that ship. Patrick always believed that his escape from Ireland was directed by a divine hand. His own people received him back with the plea that he never leave them again. But God's plan for Patrick's life was not to be carried out in his homeland. I saw in the night the vision of a man whose name was Victoricus coming, as it were, from Ireland with countless letters. And he gave me one of them. And I read the opening words of the letter, which were the voice of the Irish. And as I read the beginning of the letter, I thought that at the same moment I heard their voice, and thus did they cry out as with one mouth, we ask thee, boy, come and walk among us once more. Responding to the voices of the Irish people, Patrick went back to Ireland. There his career as a preacher and teacher eventually earned him the title of saint and placed him in the ranks of the world's best known Christian missionaries. But something that isn't so well known about him is this. Saint Patrick kept the seventh day Sabbath. In fact, his Sabbath keeping became legendary. Two centuries after his death, his biographer wrote that every seventh day, Patrick and his friend Victoricus met together for prayer and fellowship. Some historians even think that Patrick's special Sabbath day friend was actually an angel. We really don't have to rely solely on the writings or experience of Patrick to understand the history of keeping the seventh day in Ireland. After all, ancient Irish laws governed the history of the Irish tribes for many years, and those laws stipulated that the people were to, among other things, keep the seventh day Sabbath. 
It seems to have been customary in the Celtic churches of early times to keep Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as a day of rest from labor. They obeyed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. As the influence of the Roman religion increased, it gradually affected the Sabbath practice of some Celtic Christians in the British Isles. By the early 6th century, it was not unusual for Celtic believers to keep both Saturday and Sunday as holy days. That's how it was during the lifetime of Patrick's spiritual successor, an Irishman named Columba. He was a graduate of one of the schools established by Patrick. Born about 521 into a noble family, he gave up his right to the throne of Ireland and dedicated himself to a higher calling. Columba based his missionary enterprise on the rocky island of Iona. He and 12 friends reached that remote post by sailing from the west coast of Scotland in small round boats made of animal skin. There on Iona, Columba founded a training school for missionaries who carried the Christian message to the Scottish mainland and all over Britain. In doctrine, Columba was true to his Celtic Christian roots. He kept Saturday, the seventh day, as the Sabbath, while Sunday was observed in honor of the resurrection of Christ. Columba taught his disciples to keep the Sabbath as equally sacred. His teachings regarding the observance of the Sabbath was that his followers would go out to the edges of the island of Iona, meditate upon creation and the things of God, and read the scriptures and become spiritually charged up on that holy day. Columba and his fellow missionaries firmly planted the Christian religion in Scotland. Their converts resisted the growing influence of Rome, which promoted Sunday as the day of worship. Columba died in 597, but his beliefs lived on for hundreds of years in the religion of the Scots. In 1070, Malcolm, King of Scotland, married Margaret, a young woman who was destined to become more famous than her husband. She made her mark in history primarily as a religious reformer. In fact, she was later sainted by the Roman Catholic Church. We know that Queen Margaret grew up at the very pious court of the kings of Hungary, and then from about the age of seven or eight, she was living at the court of Edward the Confessor of England, which was also a very pious, devoutly Catholic court. At the English court, Margaret lived under the influence of the Benedictine monks from Canterbury. When political conditions made her family unwelcome in England, they moved to Scotland where Margaret caught the eye of the king. Margaret herself uh, seems to have contemplated becoming a nun. There is an account of how unwilling she was to marry Malcolm, King of Scots, because she had wanted to dedicate herself to be, as she termed it, a bride of Christ. Margaret's biographer does tell us that in her early life, she was very devoted to the church, uh, and she was interested in becoming a religious. But when she came to Scotland and she met uh, Malcolm, her future husband, he asked for her hand in marriage, and according to her biography, she wasn't willing, but she consented because her family requested it, and also because she believed that God was thereby giving her an opportunity to carry out his work in the Kingdom of Scotland. Margaret found the Scottish court somewhat crude and unrefined, so she set about to change all that. She was appalled at the way folks in Scotland practiced their religion. Many still followed the doctrines and traditions brought by Columba from Ireland nearly five centuries earlier. There was one aspect of the people's religion that particularly upset the new queen. When Margaret first came to Scotland, she was dissatisfied with Sunday observance as she found it. She found that lay people tended to carry on their menial labors on Sunday. They may have gone to church first, but thereafter, uh, they went about their ordinary everyday tasks, and this was something she tried to prevent. 
the Queen insisted upon the single and strict observance of the Lord's Day, Sunday. People and clergy alike submitted, but without entirely giving up their reverence for Saturday. The history of the early Christian centuries reveals the definite anti-Seventh-day Sabbath pro-Sunday movement. And church documents unmistakably identify the religious establishment at Rome as its nerve center. The Roman drive to replace the Seventh-day Sabbath with Sunday got a big boost back in 321 A.D. That's the year Constantine ordered state-authorized Sunday observance. Oddly enough, in spite of his professed Christianity, there was very little Christian about his first Sunday law. In fact, it sounds a lot like a call to pagan sun worship. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. With a sympathetic emperor on the throne, the leaders of the Roman church gained power and influence. In their councils, they took bold steps to enforce Sunday observance and to urge desecration of the biblical Sabbath. Some of their actions took on a definite anti-Jewish flavor. Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's Day, Sunday, and if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. These pronouncements against Judaizers referred to those who, like the Jews, refused to work on the Sabbath. Christians who did this were to be excommunicated, kicked out of the church. This extreme position against the Sabbath combined with a strong pro-Sunday stance, became a pillar of Roman Catholic teaching. The Sabbath to Sunday change became a mark of Roman Catholic or papal authority. In 602, Pope Gregory identified Sabbath keepers with the Antichrist. He called them Judaizers because of their determination to observe the seventh day as a day for rest and worship. It has come to my ears that certain men of perverse spirit have sown among you some things that are wrong and opposed to the holy faith, so as to forbid any work done on the Sabbath day. Christians in the Italian city of Milan dared to openly observe the Sabbath no matter what the leadership in Rome wanted. The Church of Milan followed the churches of the East. It seems the Saturday was held in a fair esteem. They, the churches of the East, came together on the Sabbath day to worship Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. Over the centuries, the attempt to establish Sunday as a substitute for the biblical Sabbath was probably only mildly successful. But the campaign was really intensified with a move that threatened to drive a deep wedge between the Eastern and Western branches of Christianity. This move involved a direct assault on the very nature and purpose of Sabbath observance. What was this direct assault? It was a rule forbidding Christians to eat on the seventh day. In other words, a Sabbath fast. This was an anti-Jewish idea that probably originated with Marcion, a heretic who was kicked out of the church back in the second century. Marcion wanted to discredit the Sabbath because it was an image of creation. For him, creation was an evil deed of an evil God, the God of the Old Testament. He distinguished the God of the Old Testament from the God of the New, the God of love. But the church rejected this uh, because creation was a good deed, and the God of the Old Testament is the same with the God of the New. So he turned a celebratory day into a day of lament. And that was his intention. This is why he introduced the Sabbath fast. In spite of its action against him, the church salvaged his fast idea and used it to make the seventh-day Sabbath unappealing. <laughs> 
Now, this was uh, absolutely contrary to what had been taught in Judaism. In Judaism, Sabbath was a day of feasting. In fact, to fast on the Sabbath meant to break the Sabbath. And so this was another way of distancing Christianity from Judaism. Turning the Sabbath day into a day without food was a very effective strategy, especially since the sixth day, Friday, was also a day of fasting for many believers. In a single generation, young Christians grew up with a built-in dislike for the Sabbath, the day of fasting and gloom, and with a corresponding attraction to Sunday, the day of celebration and feasting. It was the church in Rome that championed uh, the fasting on Sabbath and the feasting on Sunday. In fact, in the fourth century, Pope Sylvester said that uh, it was good to do this in contempt of the Jews. If every Sunday is to be observed joyfully by the Christians on account of the resurrection, then every Sabbath on account of the burial is to be regarded in execration of the Jews. In other words, Christians were told to fast on the Sabbath as an expression of their contempt for the Jews, even as an acted out curse against them. But even this particular anti-Sabbath strategy was only partly successful. Prominent church leaders opposed it. Hippolytus, a third century bishop, felt it was a big mistake. Even today, some order fasting on the Sabbath, of which Christ has not spoken, dishonoring even the gospel of Christ. There is even a report that Augustine, one of the most influential of the Roman church fathers, came to the defense of church members who ignored the Sabbath fast. The leaders in Rome were eventually successful in imposing the Sabbath fast on their followers in the Western world of Christianity. But the same could not be said for what happened in the East. Where the Orthodox influence was strongest, Eastern Christianity resisted this, and their views on the Sabbath were really quite different. Sabbath fasting does not make any sense uh, for the Orthodox because the Sabbath is the day that marks two great events, the completion of creation and the completion of redemption. So Sabbath is a day of double celebration and could never be associated with fasting and lament. This issue of the Sabbath fast may seem, from our vantage point, like a tempest in a teapot. But it became part of the struggle for power within the church, an east-west tension that would eventually rip the Christian world in two. In 692, the Emperor Justinian II called a church council in Constantinople. A controversial meeting, it's known as the Council in Trullo, named after the palace where the bishops assembled. This was the Eastern Church's big chance to strike a blow against the growing influence of the Pope in Rome. Canon 55 of the Council of Trullo uh, is based on one of the apostolic canons, Canon 64, and several other canons of local councils. The principle that we get out of all these canons is that you cannot fast on a festive day. Sabbath is a festive day. It celebrates two events, the completion of creation, the completion of redemption, so it could never be associated with fasting. Those bishops could write a million laws, but they would be nothing but ink on paper without the unanimous approval of the highest officials in the church. So the bishops had to send their canons to Rome for the Pope's signature. It was sent to the Pope because the Pope was the first patriarch, a first among equal, five equal patriarchs, who constituted the leadership of the church. As it was the custom in all councils, they had to be approved, signed by all, as a sign of their unity in faith and order. The Pope did not sign the canons of the Council of Trullo because they objected to Sabbath fasting. He was out of tune with the other churches and that is why he did not sign. He was convicted, and therefore action, appropriate action, was taken by the emperor. He was put under house arrest. 
So the council in Trullo didn't settle the issue. In the West, Christians kept the fast. In the East, they didn't. The Sabbath fast persisted as a divisive issue, a symbol of the growing tension between Constantinople and Rome. In 867, Photius, Patriarch of Constantinople and the Pope's chief rival for power, invited his fellow Eastern Patriarchs to another church council. During the council, he accused the entire Western church of eight points of heresy. The Photian schism uh, between uh, Constantinople and Rome was based on several issues. A primary issue was the controversy over the Sabbath. And this is uh, seen in the documents, the primary documents that relate to this controversy. Using fraud and artifice, they have tried to turn these people from the pure faith of Christianity. They have required them to observe the Sabbath fast, contrary to the canons of the church. The two sides had very little interaction for the next two centuries. Then the old quarrels were aggravated by new disputes. Like rival monarchs trying to build up their own kingdoms, the Pope and the Patriarch each tried to gain the upper hand. The big issue that was at stake in 1054 between East and West was the issue of authority, authority in the church. The Pope imposed customs, Western customs, Roman customs, on Byzantine churches in Italy. And one of them, of course, was the celebration of a fast or the keeping of a fast on a Sabbath day. The Pope sent one of his most prominent representatives, Cardinal Umbert, to negotiate with Michael Carolarius, the Orthodox Patriarch. The effort was fruitless. Neither side would yield for the sake of Christian unity. Things went from bad to worse. And then came the 16th of July, 1054. And so the papal legates, having become bored by the opposition of the patriarch, as they said, decided on a most insolent action. On the 16th of July, they entered the church of Hagia Sophia, and while the clergy were preparing for the service at the third hour of the day on Saturday, they laid a bull of excommunication on the main altar in full view of the clergy and people present. Going out thence, they shook off even the dust from their feet as a testimony against them, exclaiming, let God see and judge. As soon as the papal legates were out of sight and hearing, the emperor ordered the burning of the document of excommunication. Michael Carolarius called another council, which issued its own excommunication against the Latin church. And so the excommunicated excommunicated the excommunicators. <laughs> It's clear that loyalty to the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment did not die out easily. Roman church efforts to promote the Sunday alternative continued. One novel approach took the form of a letter, a letter that supposedly came directly from heaven. God has enjoined Sunday to be kept holy. For God's own hand has written that command to men, lest they should do either work or servile labor on Sunday. The letter itself claims to have been written by Jesus. Uh, we're told that it appeared on the altar of St. Peter in Rome, uh, that the priest who was saying mass discovered it there and was obviously quite scared by it. A letter from heaven. Think about it. Who wouldn't want one of those to support their opinions? That'd be a pretty convincing weapon of persuasion, especially to the uneducated and superstitious people of medieval times. It's not uncommon in the Middle Ages for people to support their claims by a letter supposedly coming from heaven. There couldn't be any better way uh, of supporting yourself than having a letter from God. It's very difficult to say exactly how the letter reached Ireland. But the most likely explanation is that an Irish monk went on a pilgrimage to the continent, acquired the letter there somehow, 
and brought it back home with him. However it got there, we do know quite precisely what it said. The whole letter was preserved as part of Irish law. In Ireland, the Epistle of Jesus is one part of a larger collection of works about Sunday observance. The first two elements are quite brief, and they talk about some of the punishments. Then the third element is the letter itself. And finally, we have a lengthy law tract which goes into much more detail about what will happen on an individual basis if certain transgressions of Sunday actually happen. Whatsoever plague and trouble has come into the world, it is through the transgression of Sunday that it has come. There are, moreover, in certain eastern parts, beasts which were sent to men, and it is to avenge the transgression of Sunday they have been sent. Some of the threats in the letter are quite fantastical and perhaps even frightening. We're told that great beasts and locusts are simply waiting to avenge the transgression of Sunday. There will be massive rainstorms with thunder, lightning, hailstones. There will be flying serpents in the sky. So basically, a whole lot of evil and destruction is going to occur if people violate the law of Sunday. To the naive medieval mind, these threats of miraculous punishments must have sounded terrifying. Better to reform your Sunday observance than to risk the terrors of supernatural plagues and catastrophe. This so-called epistle of Jesus clearly supported the rulings of church councils and the declarations of the popes. But it stood in direct conflict with the Sabbath law of the Ten Commandments. The epistle of Jesus belongs to the massive body of apocryphal literature, and that's to say not canonical, not part of the Bible, and shouldn't be taken in any way at face value. This letter from Jesus shows how determined medieval Roman church leaders were to replace the biblical Sabbath with Sunday. Similar schemes involving messages from heaven were used in other places in other centuries. In the year 1200, Eustace of Flay, a French abbot, arrived in England and started the medieval version of a revivalist campaign. He argued that folks shouldn't buy and sell on Sundays. Realizing that his efforts were unsuccessful, he went home to France. In 1201, he came back again. This time, he was reinforced with a letter supposedly delivered from heaven and laid on the altar of St. Simeon in Jerusalem, in which God himself threatened punishment to those who worked or bought and sold on Sundays. The attempt to enforce uh, the abstinence from work on Sundays continues throughout the Middle Ages in church councils, in papal rulings, in canon law, and in the courts. And obviously the fact that the attempt is continuing to enforce this rule means that it is not always being observed. In general, however, the Church of Rome succeeded in establishing and enforcing Sunday observance. After all, emperors and kings were under obligation to enforce church law. Besides that, except in a few isolated areas, the church controlled access to the Holy Scriptures. For the most part, the common man depended on the priest for his understanding of the Bible and its teachings. But there were remote places where the Scriptures still existed in the language of the peoples. And in those places, there were very courageous groups who resisted church authority and persisted in keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath. In the mountains of northern Spain and Italy and southern France, there are entire groups of individuals who are legendary for their resistance to the power of Rome. People like the Albigenses, the Cathari, the Pasaginis, and the Waldenses. Reports from that era tell us that among these groups, there were many who observed the Seventh-day Sabbath. Opponents accused the Cathari and some of the Waldenses of teaching that Christians should keep the law of Moses to the letter, including the Sabbath commandment. The Pasagini kept the Sabbath because they believed it existed even before the law of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> 
There is a 12th century account about a group of Cathari, four men and a child, who while traveling near Cologne, France, were captured and burned at the stake for not attending church on the Lord's Day or Sunday. The church state establishment had the power to impose its will even by force of arms. It did not hesitate to use persecution and coercion against the dissenters. Then John Wycliffe came on the scene and the Christian world would never be the same again. John Wycliffe was born in Yorkshire, in a little town called Hipswell, of a rather wealthy family in a manorial house. And they had enough funds to send their very precocious son to Oxford to be educated. And that became really his home for the rest of his life. That was the center of his life, of his interest, and of his influence. Wycliffe was a man who was passionately in love with the Word of God and sought to make that Word of God known to the English people. He loved that Word of God to the point where he was willing to stand against the authorities of the church of his day, even a great loss to himself and personal risk. For example, on the matter of the individual reading the Bible, the established church took the view that we ordinary laymen are too dumb to do that. It takes somebody with years of higher education to really be able to understand the Bible. The hierarchy of the church very strongly opposed uh, the Bible being available in the vernacular to the average layperson because this would um, circumvent the role of the priest and would give a certain type of power to the laity to interpret the scripture for themselves. John Wycliffe had a real understanding and respect for the person. At the time in which he lived, all religious instruction and teaching came through the institutional church. And the institutional church was failing in teaching the people the Word of God. Wycliffe thought that the teachings of the Bible were clear enough to be understood by the common people. If they could read it, they could determine for themselves what to believe and how to behave. And I believe to some extent the church was fearful of that because it would take away the power, the authority, and the prestige that they were enjoying at that time. The motivation that John Wycliffe had for translating the Bible into English goes back to his view that the supreme authority in all matters of faith and conduct is the Bible. Wycliffe was the driving force behind the translation of the Bible into Middle English. Um, we sort of see him as the father of the project. John Wycliffe didn't limit his interest to the translation of the Bible. He became an outspoken and unrelenting critic of the church. His pen became a weapon in his hand. The church provided him with ample targets, like when Pope Innocent III declared that it was necessary for all people to be subject to the Bishop of Rome. John Wycliffe uh, felt that the papal authority, first of all, had no foundation in scripture. And secondly, he thought that it was very corrupt and had distorted the gospel and had added many human institutions, the, with the primary purpose of which seemed to be to raise money for Rome. And uh, he objected to the general uh, corruption of the whole papal system. And Wycliffe, had the view that the Pope was doing the work of Antichrist. John Wycliffe was viewed by those who were in opposition uh, to him really in two separate ways. One, I believe there was a great admiration for him in the fact that he was a professor of theology and philosophy at Oxford and the best known theologian of his day. However, they also saw him as a dangerous person. The attitude of the Roman Catholic Church toward John Wycliffe was that he was the, the greatest of all heretics, of his time anyway, uh, because he attacked the church so vigorously as the Antichrist. John Wycliffe might have lived a peaceful life 
if he had been willing to keep his views to himself. But by blazing away with tongue and pen, he made himself a rallying point for others of like mind. He was a charismatic man who attracted loyal followers and supporters. The followers of John Wycliffe were known as Wallards. The Lollards were inspired by John Wycliffe uh, to distribute the Bible uh, to the ordinary people, the Bible in English. And they went about the countryside with their sandals and their russet gowns and their staffs and very little else uh, all over England. Initially, the term Lollard was considered derisive and derogatory. And the word itself comes from the Dutch word lullen, which means to mumble, and was used to refer to them as mumblers um, or religious fanatics, too. Eventually, the term is embraced by the Lollards themselves. And in one wonderful text about the biblical translation, they refer to Jesus himself as the greatest Luller that ever was. One of the questions of all time is the question of authority. In Wycliffe's day, there were two views. The church felt they had the authority because they were infallible and had been given that right by God. The Lollards, on the other hand, believed that ultimate authority was in God through the scriptures. Eventually, the Lollard movement turned underground and even pietistic. And what I mean by that, that they began to study the Bible in a more literalistic way. They sought to apply it to their hearts and their lives in a way that was most in agreement with what the text of scripture said. Some of the Lollards uh, became Sabbatarians believing that worship should take place on the seventh day according to the scriptures. Really, the only information we have about the Lollards who were Sabbath keepers are the court records of their trials. For example, we have the story of one of these people, John Senyo, and he is, uh, was brought to trial in 1402 for practicing his Sabbatarian beliefs, and he uh, professed that he would continue to do so until someone could prove from scripture that he was in error. With this view of the sacred scriptures, it's not surprising that there were Sabbath keepers among those Lollards. They were forerunners of many who would rediscover the seventh day Sabbath during the Protestant Reformation. In 1377, Pope Gregory XI issued formal statements accusing Wycliffe of heresy. But the Roman Church could not effectively restrict the spread of his ideas. They were too powerful, too compelling. Once they reached the educational centers of Europe, there was no way to stop them. Wycliffe's teachings inspired revolutionary ideas in the minds of early Protestant reformers. That's why historians have called Wycliffe the morning star of the Reformation. The Church of Rome lashed out against all of those who believed that Scripture held authority over the Church. While Wycliffe died of natural causes, many of his followers were not so fortunate. A severe persecution broke out, and this persecution was made possible primarily because of a very close relationship between the Church and the English government. In those late medieval centuries, the relationship between church and state in England was close to the point of cozy. Both institutions cozied up. To a very large extent, the state was administered by senior churchmen. The bishops of the church in England ran the state for the king. On the other hand, the state supported the church, and most notably through the statute, the Act of Parliament of 1401, known as the Act for the Burning of Heretics. In this way, the state repaid its debts to the church by maintaining the exclusive position of the church in England against the heretical minority known as Lollards. In spite of the opposition of the church-state confederacy, John Wycliffe's ideas took root in the hearts of many in England, including some wealthy members of the nobility. John Oldcastle was one of the many noblemen who were attracted to the Wycliffe High points of view, but he supported it in many ways with his money, but also he became a devout preacher of the Wycliffeite point of view. And when that was forbidden by an act of parliament on pain of imprisonment or death, he just kept right on doing it. And, uh, and he finally was arrested and burned at the stake. 
Religious institutions have a sad record of resorting to force when the powers of persuasion fail. This seems especially true when church and state unite. And this certainly was true of the Church of Rome in the Middle Ages. If the supreme authority of the church could be maintained, the teachings of scripture could lie unheeded and forgotten. But if the Bible came to be seen as the sacred source of doctrine and the legitimate guide for Christian practice, the power of the church and its traditions would be greatly diminished. And thanks to John Wycliffe, that is precisely what happened in the centuries leading up to the Protestant Reformation. As knowledge of the Bible increased, so did a revived understanding of God's plan for mankind as revealed in the Ten Commandments. And that, of course, impacts our story of the seventh day. With the availability of the Bible in the language of the common man, the stage was set for the rediscovery of the Bible's Sabbath. And that's the story we will tell when we return with part four of the seventh day.